Yeah, so we've seen fantastic talks today and many, many beautiful visualizations, and I'm going to do um, the opposite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also start with... Um, let, let, me start, let me start with a story, and let me start getting this to work. Or not. So, imagine you're starting a new project, and your project relies on modeling data. And so you go and you collect all these data sources. You collect, not data sources, you read all these old papers. You read, um, I don't know, tons and tons of papers. You get all the plots, you get all the figures, and you are very, very confident that you have all the data you need. And um, all that data was collected in the 80s because your model needs all of that. That's the data. And um, that is something that happened to me. So I was trying to model, trying to build up a model. Um, I had all these data sources, and it all looked like that. Um, and I think, I think what that made me realize that even though all of that data has been published, and it's been published ages ago, and so no one's going to go and collect that data again, hopefully, um, it isn't really, really open, or it's not as accessible as it can be, especially not old data. And so when we visualize, um, what I think we need to realize is that we are encoding the data that we've collected. And so if we are not also providing the data source, all we are left with is this visualization, which can be fantastic and beautiful and interactive. But unless the data is also there, we're keeping that data away from the people who might be able to use it in future work. So I sat there and I thought, wouldn't it be great if I had a way to decode that published data? And I did, I did have a way. I had my little ruler and I had a sharp pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and it took forever. Um, <laughs> and as I said, I'm a lazy person, so that was not quite enough for me. So I um, went and made my own tool, calling it Tracy. <laughs> um, and let me switch screens to the better version. <laughs> <laughs> It probably also says when, like, when about it was made. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to um, basically scrape, those old, scrape this old data in a better way than with a ruler and a pencil, because that takes forever. And so what I made is a tool where you can upload super old data in terms of an image. So this is just a screenshot from exactly the same paper. I think it was 86. Um, make a coordinate system. I'm going to enter my axes, so that goes from minus 80 to 60, and from minus 1,500 to 500. And then I go and I start and trace my data points. And so this already did not take nearly as long as just sharpening my pencils. <laughs> I'm going to add a second trace. And export the data. Um, stolen data. <laughs> Jason. And so what this allows me to do now that I've downloaded this data, um, and it took about half a minute to get it, um, I can import that into any environment that I'm comfortable with. This is very, very small, isn't it? I'm comfortable with a Jupyter notebook, so I'll go and I load all my visualization uh, toolboxes, load my stolen data, and it looks like this. So the tool exports a JSON file, but also exports a uh, CSV file, which is like a spreadsheet. So one of those columns is just a list of numbers, and then I can quickly go and I can make um, an interactive visualization with the data I just scraped from that plot. And I can take that data and I can analyze it, and it's truly available to me now. OK, so the things that, I, that were important to me making that were that it's uh, universal, that it's really easy to use, which I think I've shown, um, that it's lightweight. Uh, so I've, before making this tool, I've obviously looked into other tools that kind of try and do the same thing. Um, a lot of them are um, trying to do lots and lots of things. Um, so they, they, they feel very heavy and they feel very um, unwieldy. 
and I also wanted it to be free and open. And that led me to using JavaScript, which uh, we've heard of all day, how beautiful it is. Um, it is universal because it runs in a browser. It's very easily to deploy. The whole thing is uh, a JavaScript tool. Um, it's got a minimalistic interface. Um, at the moment, I'm hoping to keep it that way. Um, it's lightweight in terms of how much data you need to download into your browser every time you run it. There is uh, some room to improve on my end, and all the code is free and open, and it's all on GitHub. Um, and I want to um, show you that it's also maybe not as hard to write something like that as you might imagine. Um, the, and I'll show a little bit of code. The whole foundation is basically when I click somewhere, I want to know the coordinate of that. I apologize for the tiny little number. It's up here. It's, the coordinate is 284 um, and 21. And so I want to get the coordinate of where I click, and I also want to make a little dot where I click. And as I said, I wrote this in um, JavaScript um, and HTML. And so HTML, for those who are not familiar with it, is just a way of um, telling the browser which components are on the page and giving little containers for each. And so I've got two containers in here. One starts with diff, so that's my display. That's my display of numbers. And then the second one is um, it's called an SVG, which is the canvas of my data points. And then in my JavaScript file, which gets loaded when I open the web page, all I do is I get a reference to that canvas. So that's the SVG canvas here. And I also get a reference to that display. And so now I can work with these references. And I can say every time I click on the canvas, please give me the x coordinate of the page and give me the y coordinate of the page. And then using the display reference, put those coordinates in there. The second step is adding the circle, and that's not, that's not much different. Um, all of this you've now seen until showing the coordinates on the screen. The only thing that's new here is that I'm appending a circle every time I click. And this is using the beautiful D3 library, which again, we've heard of a lot. Um, and this circle gets the attribute of the x, uh, the x coordinate of where I clicked and the y coordinate of where I clicked, and then I give it a size and I can fill it with a color. Um, so that's the basic foundation of how it works. There's obviously a little bit more work involved. Um, there is scaling it all. There is dealing with the user in terms of, I don't know, they might want to zoom into the page, which is a nightmare. They might want to click and then scroll and then click again, which is another nightmare. And so keeping track of all of those things um, takes a little bit more work. Um, that's the wrong slide. Is it? No, it's not. OK. Um, sorry. So um, for in terms of like what I did with, um, so once, once I have the coordinates of, on the screen, I need to have the coordinates uh, in the coordinate system that a person assigns. And so um, all of this is done using D3, which, again, we've heard of a lot. Um, D3 is fantastic with SVGs, which is just a really beautiful way of um, visualizing data because it's tiny um, in terms of um, data size. Uh, the rest of the app is written in React, which is doing all the heavy lifting in terms of keeping track of the data points. Um, and React is also good for building little modules that you can reuse. And so in my app, I have three modules or three components. One is simply the frame. So all that is is that header here. So if I wanted, I could reuse that bit. The next one is the interaction of the menu. And then the third one sits inside of that, and that's the actual data canvas. That's the actual bit that I click on, and that's the bit that um, connects with D3 as well. That's all the technical stuff. So one year later, um, I told people about this, and some people started using it. And so this is my favorite story. A colleague had formed a hypothesis and did a literature review and ran into the same things that I ran into, which is um, 2D plots without linked data. And he found related data that was um, collected under a different research question. But he thought it might be useful for his, for his hypothesis. So that's what the data looked like. And so again, with like pencil and ruler, um, 
Tracing each of those data points might be a bit of a pain. And so he used the app and a plotly plot should load. Oh, there it is. Okay, um, use the app, plotted it in the same way that I just did. And what this allows you now is to have interactive data, but what it also allowed him is taking this green data cloud, um, fit a curve of interest and see if this data in fact supports that, that hypothesis. And it did um, with a almost significant p-value <laughs> <laughs> of 0 0.06. It'd be boring if it was already solved, right? Um, but I've been told that this at least inspired a, a research project. And what's important to me is that th this was data that I think is collected on animals. And so this, this means that this data does not have to be collected again. And there is a data source that can be used to support something, um, even though it wasn't intended for exactly that. No, there we go. So my plans for the future for this app, because I don't think it's quite done yet. Um, I want to have logarithmic axes. Um, I want to give the user the ability to name all the traces um, and axes so that, that when, once they import it into their plotting tool, um, that understands that and can take care of plotting that directly. An undo function, which I've partially implemented and then given up on. I right click and the last dot disappears. I got too ambitious. I wanted to right-click all the way through until the first data point you've ever made. Um, that broke it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's probably the next thing I'll do, where you just undo the last three or undo the last um, trace that you've made, so the last color that you've added. Um, I need to keep in mind that I still want it to be minimalistic, so that's going to be a challenge, um, especially with like swapping axes and everything, giving it names. Um, on the data set side, um, what I really would love to implement is to save all the trace data to a database and make it truly um, open. So the user would be asked to, once they download the data, um, whether, they want, whether they want to have this data also uploaded into that database by providing a DOI uh, figure number and potentially comments so that when the next person comes, they can use the exact same data that's already been traced. Um, and then obviously a search function so you can see if you have to go and do the same work again. And that, I think, would open up um, all the data eventually, hopefully, um, especially old data. But I think even for a person who's only using it once, I don't want to necessarily store all the data that I've traced on my own computer. If I know where I can go and get it back, um, that'd be really useful even for a single, single user. Um, acknowledgements. So, that's something that really excited me. There were some people on Twitter who saw my tweet and who um, started using it instantly, which I think is a testimony to um, putting even not completely finished things up on the internet um, and how great that can be and suggested, for example, adding the um, CSV export, which I think is invaluable for people who are used to tabular data, sorry, spreadsheet data, um, but also alerted me to browser issues, so I don't have the time to go and test on every browser, so I'm, I'm really grateful that people went and go like, oh, it doesn't work on Firefox, please fix it. Um, and I've got some lovely people in my life as well who support and test. And I hope if, if anyone, that's why I said so far, so if anyone wants to use it and tell me what I did wrong, that'd be fantastic. It's also on GitHub, so if you want to also propose a fix for it, that would be even better. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Um, it's great. I still can be able to use it. Uh, I think the undo feature is particularly useful because I used one of these before. If you, if you made a mistake, that uh, that's kind of yeah. Um, so. When, when you show the, uh, the figure with a lot of dots, right? In, even though this software is going to cap so much compared to the pen and pencil, but you still have to click. Dots. Yes. Is there any way that you do, can do some, for that type of dot, you can do some image processing yeah. and identify this dot and automatically uh, assign the code in it? Yeah, so that's something, um, that's something I would love to look into, and JavaScript just 
There, there has just been a major release uh, of a machine learning JavaScript library that I want to look into for that. Um, obviously, for my little black and white plot at the beginning, like, that was even hard to do. By, like for me, no machine learning algorithm will be able to fix that in the in the near future. Um, with the scatter plot, there is a library um, that Bloomberg has released. Um, it's a Python library. It uses machine learning, and it, it does that for exactly that kind of plot. So it's only using, um, it's only working for scatter plots, and I haven't tried it. Um, and you have to download things, and you have to get Python running, which is kind of not what I would want to do. Um, but there is a there is exactly a solution for that. So um, I can find the library I've got somewhere. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It didn't make mine faster. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the question I have is, are you thinking about integrating your tool into online archives? For instance, NASA ADS, the uh, abstract data service, has a tool called Dexter mm -hmm. that is very similar to yours, not as good, has been updated in 2010. They would love to hear about um, that you don't have to go to an external web page. If there was some way for you to integrate this into the archive or ADX or something, that would be really useful. If they use React, they can just take it and put it in. Um, I don't know if you know anyone that I can contact, and sure, I'd be... I just tweeted at them. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm not at all opposed to doing that. Okay. If they're happy with the name, then... <laughs> That's not, that's that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's super cool. It's one of those sort of applications that kind of feels just a little bit like magic that <laughs> works. Um, uh, it occurs to me that another thing you could do with this is create uh, synthetic data that just looks like what you want it to look like. Mm. Um, because often you might I just want it to look like this. Um, and you could even do that with the interface you've got, just a <coughs> random image maybe, um, that's irrelevant. But perhaps that could be an interface that you could then, uh, like a separate interface for that specific purpose. Because, I mean, it would be more the interface rather than like the same, uh, the functionality would be the same otherwise. I'm confused by that. Uh, well, as in, if you have the exact same sort of, you know, yep. plots here and it converts, and then you, you, you specify in your axes, yep. but it's not about what image is underneath. Uh, ah, right. So it's more like it kind of gives you axes already, so it's sort of, you know, you could configure the axes, but. You're just plotting data. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and maybe tools like that already exist, but it seems like I don't, something. I don't think so. Yeah, but maybe making a clone of this and then I wouldn't want to put it in the same one because of minimalistic yeah. uh, approaches. For example, but... in one of Errol's um, visualization tutorials, he drew a bunch of pictures uh, out of scatter plots for letters so that you could actually animate letters of scatter plots. Oh, yeah, he used this. I was. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I've, I've used this for horrendous things, um, quite, quite honestly. Um, I have traced um, Tracy's face. Um, but, but also just, like, I don't know, one other thing I've done, that there's an image of where electrodes sit in an, electrode, uh, in an EEG cap, and I've like, got those locations out. And just, it, it seems that once you've, once you've got it, it seems endless. <laughs> so I don't want to go back. Yeah. I, know, I know where it lives, which yeah. is good. Um, would it be too heavy to integrate geographic coordinate systems into the coordinate Ooh. system selection? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it's like using a regular map. Yeah, um, map. Regular as in one of, one of the weirdly distorted ones but that have the coordinates. That'd be cool. I'll put that. Can you tweet that? <laughs> 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 um, cool, thanks, yeah. Saying is that this morning's uh, talk, well, that historical maps could have done some cool digitization on the maps that we could do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excellent, thank you very much.